Hi, everybody, uh, and thanks for joining us here for the I'm Thinking of Ending Things IndieWire Roundtable. As you can see, we are joined by a spectacular panel of filmmakers to talk about a spectacular film, which is Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things. And joining us today, we have, in addition to Charlie Kaufman, uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, Rick Linklater, Tamara Jenkins, and Boots Riley. Uh, welcome, everybody, from all over the world. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Great to be here. <laughs> yeah, everyone everyone is here uh, by their own volition. I am my choice. Uh, except, <laughs> except for Charlie, Charlie who was, <laughs> who was uh, forced here at, at Knife Point. Uh, and I, I would imagine at Knife Point, <laughs> which I don't know if that's uh, more you know dangerous <laughs> or less, but uh, we are, uh, they're all ostensibly fans of the film of Charlie. Uh, and so let's dig into it. Ostensibly, yeah. maybe not. I'm not taking it for granted. <laughs> uh, well, I just, you know, this is going to be sort of a free flowing conversation. I definitely want everyone to feel free to, to pipe in, uh, lag be damned, you know, whenever they are, whenever they feel inspired to do so. But I do just want to start with Charlie and, and just say that, you know, one of the one of the things that I love about this movie is its shape shifting ambiguity and how wildly interpretations about it uh, can vary even among the people who love it as much as I do. And, and Charlie, you've always been really outspoken about saying that you know art belongs to the audience once it gets out there and that people are free to find themselves in the film however they see fit but I, I thought it would be a fun place to start just to set the table to to check in with you about how the reaction to this movie has gone how it's aligned with your expectations if there have been any surprises in terms of the feedback you've you've gotten back if you've learned anything from it I don't know if I had any expectations I was sort of you know um I didn't, I didn't have any. So uh, I don't know. It seems to be sort of divisive, I guess, in a way that surprises me, um, but maybe it shouldn't. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I'm, I'm not starting this off very well. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's, uh, I didn't know I was going to have to talk about it. Uh, oh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like, like we're definitely not talking about it. Well, reaction, we're all here to sit in silence and look at you. And, and, and as you said, it is sort of, you know, it's there for people to react to, and that's what happens. So it's kind of, I wish, I wish that I was more true to my feeling about that in the aftermath of things coming out. I didn't sort of kind of like, okay, like it's fine and it's good and people hate it and it's good, but I don't need to pay attention to it and I do. I guess that's the, the biggest sort of issue for me is that I, sh I, I wish that I didn't pay attention to it. You're talking about having a response to the re response to the response? You're I'm up not paying attention to the, to the response right. because it's sort of a dangerous road and it's, it's, kind of, um, it's kind of a waste of time, but for some reason yeah. I'm, I'm interested in it and, <laughs> and, and, it, and it, it, because it affects me, um, it's, it's, it's stupid for me to do it, you know? But, but I, I would to, say- I'm trying to work. That I'm seems sorry. like that's, that's part of it, right? Like oh, our art is also a critique, right? And so, which is probably why you seem to be in your work interested in, in critics as an art form as well, right? In, in yeah. Because your work is, a, our work is a critique of everything that's out there to a certain extent. So we're gonna read the critiques of our work, you know? I mean, and somewhere in the back of the mi our mind, it seems like, you know, I, I assumed you're writing things knowing they're gonna be divisive, but you still have this in the back of your mind, like some people are gonna hate this, but, but maybe everyone will will discover something new and all of a sudden everyone will say they love it and uh, yeah i mean you know i think you're right but it's like it's like weird it's not just critics it's like reading reading stuff online reading tweets from sort of yeah, the tweets are where they get you oh and, yeah but Char charlie is is covid making you pay more attention than in the normal uh film release reality I mean, I think truthfully, I always pay attention, but yeah, it makes it worse. Like, like, okay, so the New York Times 
A.O. Scott and, and Dargis came out with their top 10 lists last night. And I, I looked at the New York Times and I saw it and I looked and, um, and I wasn't there. And then I started to read the comments and there's a comment from somebody basically saying, thank God I'm, I'm thinking of ending things wasn't in the list. And it's like, well, it wasn't in the list. What are you doing? Why are you adding this? Thank God. I mean, it's you got what you want. And then, and it was the only movie that, and I looked last night, I haven't looked since because it was a mistake to look, but there were like, like five or six replies at the time saying, yeah, thank God. Yeah, you know, holy, I can't believe it. Oh, no. I'm so happy. And it, it's weird because it's like, it, it feels personal, you know? Yeah. And I guess that's the thing that I, it's not the critique boots. It, it, it's the, it's when it gets weirdly personal and I, and, and, and I think the truth is you don't know where these things are coming from or why they're coming from, you know? And, uh, and so you kind of, you have to, I think, um, take that into consideration when you weigh it as a, as a thing. Can I jump in a second as a fellow filmmaker? I mean, I don't envy the position you're in right now. It does suck when your film comes out, you've really got to deal with what the world's bouncing back on you for this for this window of time. But, yeah. you know, rest assured, when we look back at 2020, this period in history, you have offered the world maybe the greatest like cinematic gift. You know, I think I've heard a little bit of that chatter and I've checked out a little bit of it. But those are just I personally just think those are sort of impoverished people who are kind of poisoned by the storytelling tropes that they've come to accept, you know, like you've, you're kind of in pure cinematic territory. Like all of us as directors, we try to tell stories. We're, we're looking for the right form to fit our content, the right form to express the emotions and our story. And you've used cinema here in a way that it really works best, but so few, you know, can pull it off. Like in that area where we process a memory or these thoughts or regret, everything your beautiful film is about is so purely cinematic. And it's nice. closer to the way we actually process the world in our own thoughts. If they would get out of three act perfect structures that's come up over time, you know, so I just see them as not, they're just not opening their eyes to what it is because they're so weighted with, you know, the storytelling universe we've all been come to accept so and I watched it the first time and I I knew I had to watch it a second time in a way I, but I, I held out I just kind of like hanging out in that slightly unknowing confused state because to me that mirrors life that you know yeah. you have a sense there's a lot going on and you're just not fucking getting it you know and that's but it's there so when I watched it a second time of course it is there, it was there all along. It's a beautiful construction, it's so intricate. It's really special how devoted a son you are. I'm glad to hear you say that, that makes me feel better. Sometimes it feels like no one sees the good things you do. Like you're just alone. So the appreciation goes up, but the, the, the feelings are, are slightly different, but I appreciated it both levels. The first emotional impact of feeling something, but then also going, I feel something, but I don't get it. Well, isn't that how we go through fucking life? And then the second time I knew it more intellectually because movies give you a chance, life does it, a kind of a do-over. You can see it again and really process it. Life, you're understanding only in retrospect, and processing best you can in real time. So um, I don't know. I, ju I just think your film's just a triumph, you know, but, you know, so are your others, you know. So you, you just kind of have your own language and people might be slow to pick up on it. But rest assured, you, you know, you're, you're going to be fine in the, in the, in the long well, term. That, that's, I mean, it's really, really nice of you to say. Um, so thank you. And I have yeah, a question. I hope, I hope hey, this don't helps read start. the fucking comments. Early. I wish you, you got to be doing something. I have, a question, I have a question for you. Are you able to do that with your own work? Like, because I can do it with other, I can look at something that's a, you know, stupid criticism of somebody else's work and say, that's a stupid criticism. 
but I, it's harder for me to do it with my own. I'm wondering if you like, like, like Miss Kale's review of Woman Under the Influence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. No, I like other stupid reviews. No, when it's your own. No, of course it stings. It stings. Yeah. We live in this society. Look at the capitalist world. I mean, people care. There's money. There's. I mean, I would hope Netflix takes a slight edge off. You don't have to have that humiliating Monday morning box office thing. So th that would be yeah. good. That's yeah, no, that, that is it. definitely good. And, and, and because of that also, because it's on Netflix, even it doesn't disappear after a week if, if yeah. you don't go to the theater. It's just people can see it over time. So, yeah. I, I, wanted, to, uh, yeah. I wanted to open the floor to everyone talking a little bit about uh, more about the relationship between films, this film and, and the audience. I was trying to think of um, something that all of you had in common, some sort of abstract energy that would have brought us all together and made you all simpatico with, with Charlie's work. And for me, it was that you're all really brilliant at making films that feel real, but not absolute. I'm thinking of like Jesse Buckley's character in this movie who is a device, but she's not just a device. She's also concrete, someone's playing her, she's on screen. And, you know, I think whether it's the fade out at the end of Before Sunset or the entire concept of the killing of a sacred deer or the emotional ambiguity in private life or the anti-capitalist freak out, you know, of uh, sorry to bother you, you all find the right amount of room for audiences to come in. And so I guess the question generally is like, how do you leave space for the imagination that people bring to your films without just making the films themselves completely hollow? Yorgos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, the thing is that not every member of the audience feels the same way. So there's no right way of, uh, you know, striking the perfect balance. You just have to to go by how you feel. Um, you know what what you feel is right and what the right balance is for you. And um, you know, every person is going to react differently according to you know how they are, what their experiences are, how they view things. Even you know the the time of day that they're watching something and how their um, you know their mood is affects things so you you cannot really control everything um yeah you just have to 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 feel it out and feel like you are allowing people and you're not being didactic and you're not being too specific and there's mystery even for you in some of the things that you do um because that's that was something that i was wondering when i, I was i was watching the charlie's film again and i I was I wanted to ask him like whether he does know everything about everything that is in, that's in his film or there are things that he doesn't know as well because I mean that's some sometimes that's my process like some there's some things that I even myself I don't I don't want to have the answer for because um, it ruins it for me I I, I just want to be lost in it and discover things and uh, let things to chance uh, so no matter how precise something looks and specific, there still needs to be some some open, uh, you know, some some porthole in order to get in or get out if you want to. I think when I'm when I'm writing something, I'm I, I set out to explore something that I don't entirely understand, and through the process of writing it, I think that I come to some sort of um, understanding, but never a complete understanding. But the, the, the thing that I'm thinking I'm doing, or I, I hope I'm doing is that I'm doing this thing and it is um, in essence, a conversation that I'm having with, which is a one-sided conversation because I can't hear what the, the person watching it is thinking, but it, it's, it's open. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm mulling things. I'm thinking about things. And I'm and then and I'm putting it out there and then seeing and the, the the idea would be that it's contradictory enough um, that there is a conversation to be had. It isn't it isn't didactic. It isn't it isn't saying oh, okay. Here's the conclusion. You know, here's what you must think now. Um, and I think in order to do that, I do have to. Some of it does have to be sort of um, secret from me as well. You know, otherwise I'm gonna go into that territory of kind of like preaching, which I'm not interested in doing. You know, what you've created is such a, 
you know, intricate layered uh, construction, you know, the way it circles back and splinters off into alternate realities. I'm just wondering from a filmmaker standpoint, do you, um, what, how much might it change between your shooting script, the one you're working with the actors and you're just about to start shooting and your final cut? Is there room, like, are you surprised sometimes? Do you have revelations? Do you wake up in the morning and go, oh, I've created this thing, but that doesn't actually make sense in the logic of my piece and no one else would understand it except you. You change things, do, do things drop out? Do is there longer cuts with elements that didn't kind of work? You know, the way yeah. uh, you know, other films, is that open or is it more, do you buy in at that level? I, I'm just wondering, yeah, is there? I mean, we had a, I mean, this movie is, this movie is less modular than like something like Eternal Sunshine, which where we could move around memories and we did. Yeah. Um, but this, because there's a sort of progression in the story that has to, you know, there's this and then there's, the house and then there's car ride and then there's the ice cream and then there's a the school. Um, so we kept pretty much to um, intention of that was in the script. Then we had some screenings uh, for, for um, you know, friends and family type, very right. small screenings. And we listened to the conversations and um, if there was some confusion about something that we didn't want there to be confusion about, and there was actually very little, um, uh, then we would try to address it. If it if it was if it was something we wanted to remain open, we wouldn't we wouldn't change it. Um, and but it was very interesting to listen to the conversations afterwards uh, after these screenings. Um, and there was there there were all of these different sort of ideas and interpretations of it. And people were pulling different things from them and getting it, which I really was hoping for. Yeah, so um, so yeah, I'd say that I'd say that other movies. Um, Eternal Sunshine, uh, I think we moved stuff around more in Synecdoche, although that was also kind of like a little bit on a linear track. Um, but this one, this one, very little. I, so I, I often, and this kind of goes to the, 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 the last question as well. I often uh, think of you as a child of Rod Serling. And, but I think that that may be wrong and you're really um, the cinematic version of the Smiths. And I think that that, is maybe where some people kind of get really uh, offended by it because it really has to do with how you deal with those emotions in life, right? Like, yeah. you know, um, you, if, if, you know, everyone gets depressed and is worried about existence, but some people um, do a good job of ignoring those ideas. And then you come with a film that's like, I'm not gonna let you ignore this. And, um, and it feels uncomfortable in a different way for folks. And they're, they're used to watching things um, that, that basic, a, a lot of us are used to watching things that, that uh, just kind of co-sign the way we think the world is. And yeah. so some of that, you know, that some some of what you you'll get in that response is will change by those very same people later on or you know um, and right. and 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 so it means that your that your film is working if it's doing that yeah I mean on my better days I agree with that I mean it's it's you know when I have my own sort of insecurities or or I need a I need an endorphin boost or something you know because. Um, you know, I'm working on something and I'm struggling with something, which is what's going on now. Cause I'm always struggling when I'm working. And, uh, you know, I think because of the COVID thing, it, it, it is sort of um, um, exaggerated kind of feeling of, of isolation and I need something, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, my feeling about things like, like loneliness and depression or things that I try to explore is that I, I feel that it, my intention is not to bring people down. My intention is to sort of like say this is there and maybe you're not alone if you feel it. You know what I mean? 
Because the other stuff, the very happy That's why stuff, I say the Smiths, because yeah. that really depends. You, whether you like that group or not has a lot to do with what, how you did, you know, whether you can find connection in that sadness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of something that I get from Charlie's movies that I also get from, you know, the Smiths is the idea that any truly great work of art, something that resonates with you that strongly can't ultimately be depressing because even if it's about our isolation and how we silo ourselves away from one another and invent each other with our thoughts, the idea of feeling yourself, you know, resonating through somebody else's experience, somebody else's creation is so strong and unifying that like even, you know, at the end of, uh, at the end of I'm Thinking of Any Things, which doesn't exactly end on uh, the most uplifting note, you know, <laughs> explicitly, I still feel so sort of picked up just by the intensity and the resonance of what I've seen. Oh. Yeah. Can I jump in that same thing as Fassbender said, as long as movies are depressing, life isn't. <laughs> and I, I, I agree with that so much, you know, and I want to thank you, Charlie, for taking on things that, again, it's another thing that's kind of out of the social contract of what we want from movies and media is that you would take on subjects like regret, loss, roads not taken, shyness. You know, we, our deal is to have active characters doing all this heroic shit, whereas someone who's kind of regrets maybe their whole life, you know, a memory that's become something else that I don't know. It's it's beautiful territory, and we just don't see enough of it in yeah, movies. I mean, and people should be exhilarated by it because it's so real. As Boots was saying, yeah, it it doesn't have a the the melody of a Smith song to keep it. <laughs> I could see. I don't know. Maybe why it's not. I don't know. It's just important for us to to take that on. You know. The other the other aspect I think of 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 what movies do or or a lot of movies do is that it's sort of, um, it needs to be understood that it's a business and that the decisions that are made are, are mostly business decisions. And that is, but these, and, and, I, and I kind of talk about that in the movie, that these business decisions are actually entering into people's brains and affecting their psyches. And the, the intent of the people who are producing these things is not to do something positive um, for those people. It is to sell something, you know, and, and I think there's something very insidious about that. And, and I, do, I do think it needs to be understood and thought about because it's, it's very, I mean, we just look at the society we live in now, everything is about trying to get you to, you know, to, to, to incentivize you to um, click on something you know, one way or another to click on something so that somebody makes money somewhere. Um, and so they get more information about you. So someone else makes money somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the implications of that are horrifying. Um, but, but the reason that those movies are so successful is because they, they figured out a formula. And the same reason that you click on clickbait is because somebody knows that this is how human psychology works and people want to feel this and, you know, and feel that that rush or, or yeah. yeah, so. Yeah. Charlie, I had a really, a nice collusion of um, consuming your movie very close to the time that I read, which I had never read before, not, um, with, uh, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. And the interior, and, and which I found the book and your movie so incredible at dropping inside of the churn of the mind I mean, and and, um, and I just, it was a very exciting thing to be like eating those two things very close to each other. And that was very sparked lots of thinking about how to um, express interior states. And then, you know, and the difference between what's happening on the surface and the multiple tracks of reality. And um, I thought you um, and Virginia Woolf had a lot in common. Well, that's, that's lovely company. Um, I haven't read it, so it's so good. It's so good. You would love it. And I, I, I had only read like you know, a room of one's own. I never read any of her novels. Yeah. And so it was a mission to to read some a book of hers. A real, and it's so incredible. You would love it. I mean, oh, it's, I'm, 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 I'm definitely going to read it then. Can I tell you one thing that I thought was interesting about watching the movie? And I don't know if it was from a female 
I, um, because I was watching the movie and I was very excited that we were inside of the female's um, mind. And then when I realized she was sort of hijacked by this, she was part of the construction of a male's mind. It was really messed up. That yeah. she was so the central, she was so my protagonist. And I kind of kept with that all along. And then I was sort of fighting against the, the movie in a great way. I mean, it was really interesting, but I was, yeah, I wanted when oh. she came hijacked by the structure in a way, I was like, oh, oh. Anyway, it was really. So um, when, I, when I adapted the book, it was my, my major um, concern was figuring out how to give this character who's a bit of a cipher um, agency, you know, because I, I wanted, I didn't want her to be a device um, although she is technically a device, I wanted her to respond to what's happening to her. Because I think it's very, because I think it's a very, even though like this is, you know, fantasy thing, um, the idea of projecting onto other people in romantic relationships is not, is a real thing. And I wanted, I wanted her to be a victim of that and to start resisting it, you know. Um, at first not resisting it because it's like, you know, when you're in a new romantic relationship and someone projects onto you, it's quite wonderful because they're projecting very wonderful things onto you. And you are trying to sort of like maintain this sort of idea that you're this thing that you're not because you're not. That's at the beginning, at the beginning. <laughs> at the beginning, but then it becomes a relationship. A, <laughs> Goods and projection. You cannot, you cannot and should not maintain that. Um, and the relationship is is dead if you, if you try to. So, I, I, I was trying to in, imbue um, Jesse Buckley's character with resistance and with confusion and with that feeling of like, what the hell is going on here? I need right. to get away. Um, but being drawn back in and stuff. So I'm, I'm, I, I was, I'm interested. I'm glad that you had that reaction to it. Yeah, no, I really like, I was really, I was very connected to her and I was connected to the, like the setup. I really love, you know, it made me think of like Buried Child or um, those, which is such a great play. And, you know, he's dragging his girlfriend, dragging his girlfriend to this house of like fucked up memories and yeah. dead children in the backyard and corn and all that yeah. stuff. I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, anyway, I love that. I like that. I like that setup a lot. And also her anxiety, you know, her anxiety about becoming oppressed in a relationship at the beginning, the feeling of like the walls closing in and like, I really don't want to, um, okay, I made this date in like the surface story. I made this date to go visit his parents, but I'm really trying to get out of here. Oh shit. I, I have to go on this train ride, even though that's a suggestion that I'm going to keep on with this thing. And I'm just like, like a weird tourist and I'm not committed to this town. Like, and it's anyway, I well, thought I, that was I, pretty compelling. I love you bringing in all these references because I, I think one of the things that's so interesting about this movie is that it's hyper referential, but at the same time feels completely original, even though it's an adaptation in and of itself. And I, I think the way the movie comments on the idea of originality is so interesting because it's saying, you know, so many of our thoughts are not necessarily our own. And so much of our identity is conferred upon us by other people and, uh, and so forth. And, you know, I'm sitting here with five filmmakers who I consider to be iconoclasts in their own way. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm just curious what you think the role of originality is as a virtue in your filmmaking in Charlie's films. Is it something worth aspiring to? Is it something that as soon as it's in your mind is no longer possible to achieve? Um, how, you know, how does, how does that element play a factor in the stories that you want to tell and how you tell them? For me, I'm, I'm stealing all the time. I'm just stealing so much that it just becomes this mush of stolen things and then that way becomes something original. So I, I, I don't, you know, I just try not to steal from one place. But with that thing um, in this movie, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been complaining a lot recently about how, you know, everybody's like, oh, streaming is so great because now more people can see more movies and there's some truth to that. But 
people are watching movies differently. Like they're texting and they're, you know, doing other things. And so, you know, and, and, and I was wondering if a new kind of cinema would come out of that for, for better or worse, where they're like trying to grab you, you know, so that you're paying attention. But what I would say with this film is that it kind of is a version of something that works because of that, um, because of all those references, right? Like I stopped, I'll tell you this, I stopped the movie and watched uh, um, A Woman Under the Influence, like right after <laughs> that, right after that part, I was like, I haven't, I've got to see this movie. Mabel on Getty's bombed out because she's always trying to please everyone so that she can be considered one more victim heroine for the women's liberation. But only by women liberationists who are willing to accept textbook spin-offs as art. Juno-esque Jenna Rollins. Mrs. Cassavetes is a prodigious actress and she never lets go of the character. I agree, I, I thought she was great in the role. And then went back to watching the film. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, and, and and I'm sure there are other versions of that. And, 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 and I've heard about folks doing that, like looking something up and, and, and wanting to go along with it. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do that in a theater. I might've made a mental note and then went to do it before, but it's kind of fun. It's like, I'm, you know, this film is calling up history and calling up other things that you want to be a part of, and um, and 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 I think that that that's important, and that's also what you what what I feel like folks are doing when they're stealing, like in that. Well, maybe you don't call it stealing, being influenced, <laughs> by, but um, yeah, is is being part of the world, you know. It's interesting, like you know, when you're reading text now on a tablet, you can. They, there'll be a link and you can go to see something else like in the newspaper article or something like that. They should have that in movies now where you can just like click and you can get, you watch Woman Under the Influence and, you know. I mean, but how, how do the, the rest of you guys bear the, the, the burden of originality? I think, it, you know, all of you have been assigned and labeled that at some point along the way. Um, and I would imagine it, it adds, uh, I don't know, some pressure to, to your work and how you think about it. I, don't know. I think the obligation is to think originally, to not do something that's been done before. Um, I don't know, I, but I, don't, I wouldn't get too hung up on just the notion of originality, you know? But um, yeah, and what, what is it? You, you only know it when you see it, you know? Like Boots said, he steals from everywhere. Well, who doesn't? You know, we're all taking in the world. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't get too hung up on, I don't, I don't know. It's just, everyone approaches it differently, but we all have an inner guide who's saying, yeah, keep going in this direction. It scares me a little bit. I don't know if it's going to work, but you got to be compelled there because you're challenging yourself, you know, at your best, you know, but there, there are other stories. Cinema can be everything. There's other stories where maybe you are challenged by the form more than the original, you know, who knows? Or you're, or you're, cha or you're challenged by things that aren't, yeah, like non-formal things that mm. aren't like subject matter that's never been, or that you've never seen it approached in that way or through that sieve or, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm a mask. I'm just as anxious as <laughs> just sitting here in COVID killing myself and hating everything that comes out of my head. But um, anyway, I, if I was to think like, oh, what's original, it would be so bad. It would kill I want to hear Yogur Yorgos talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I, I think it's also a little bit about being brave, maybe, like to make choices that, you know, you don't know that they have worked uh, and you're not sure about and just, you know, like going for it and not really care how people are going to are gonna respond to it, um, which I find it is true that I find it gets... It gets harder the, the more stuff you make, the more there's an expectation. And that's why, Charlie, you shouldn't be reading any comments or any no, I, reviews. Yeah. Or anything like that. Yeah. Because, you know, it, even if you don't want it, and uh, as much as you try to, um, you know, shield yourself from it, 
um, it, it, do, it does build up and then you, you feel this pressure of, yes, having to do something better than what you did before, something different to what you did before. There's the ego involved. Um, but, but I think, yeah, bottom line is just be true to yourself and be brave to just do something that you don't know if it, anyone likes or a, if it's going to work for anyone else. I mean, that's the only way of uh, going into territory that might have not been explored. Although, I mean, I don't know how easy that is. Um, you know, there's, there's so many films being made and so many works in general or... Um, so I, I don't know how, yeah, it might be futile to just look for originality. Yeah. yeah, I think the key is just being yourself. And as in the film world, often you're taking on the genre you find yourself in. Like at what point, I'm interested on, on this film, Charlie, did you guys ever speak? I mean, I've heard horror, but I almost have trouble believing that because you're really not delivering the horror goods but was that ever like, give us the pitch. We're like, this is going to be Charlie's version of a horror movie. Did that help it get made? Sometimes I've pitched things like, <laughs> oh, I'm doing this. And then you just do whatever the hell you were thinking. <laughs> but you're in a genre that gives some form to the concept of the movie that helps you get it made. But hopefully we're all just making our version of whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing within whatever genre we find ourselves. But I mean, I, um, this was a book. And I went to Netflix with it. So, cause I was looking to be able to make something that they might finance. I was, you know, and if this was very small and it, and it was in a genre. So I pretty much sold it as the book. What genre is that by the way? What genre? I, think like a, I, I think it's like a psychological horror book. Okay. That's what I think that, you know, I think the book feels that way more than the movie does. Right, right. And I didn't really know what I was going to do with it because I never know. And I want to, maybe do a segue here to say that's the thing that in terms of originality that I try to do, which is that I just try to do something that I don't know how to do. Um, and, and then it's that by, by necessity sends me off into some sort of unknown thing. You know, what I, you know what I mean? Once I started to work on this thing, I had to make decisions about what I wanted to do with it. And I had the issue that I talked about with Jesse Buckley's character and it started to become something else. And I started to question what a horror movie is and what, whether or not I wanted to do it, whether or not I felt like I want to put a horror movie into the world, which is a genre thing, which it depends on your, your motivation is to figure out how to make something as scary as possible. And I'm not interested in that. I like horror movies sometimes. So I like watching them, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not motivated to make one. So it became what it became. Um, and, but yeah, I, I, I think there's no question that, you know, Netflix bought this before there was a script. And I think that they probably- Suckers. Yeah, they were- <laughs> I, I didn't intend to sucker them because I think they're listening now, but um, <laughs> I, I think perhaps it ended up that way. And they, you know, they didn't have to go ahead and make the movie after I turned in the script, but yeah. I guess they wanted yeah. to. I, I don't know, I don't know. But it's to the question of, of of what this movie is. We only have time for for one more question. I just want to kind of uh, ask this to the room on, on this note. You know, I've talked to Charlie about this film. I think now on three different occasions, and every time I talk to him about it, I feel like I am standing on less solid ground. That that it, it feels like the films I love are constantly slipping away from me in in a way, um, and that I understand them less every time that I watch them. And watching, I'm thinking of ending things again last night left me wondering if I understand films less because I love them, if my infatuation with them fundamentally changes what they are in my mind. Um, and I, I guess the, the question is, and I think this is a way about a lot of your films. I mean, I remember sitting in the theater and watching Dogtooth in 2010 and being like, I feel like I understand this film perfectly. I know exactly how it's resonating with me so on. And then I watched it again last year and loved it just as much, but it felt like it was more elusive and, and less settled in my mind. And the same is true of, of Private Life and so many of your other films. Uh, I guess the question is just, you know, does loving something, and I think this dovetails with the story of I'm thinking of ending things, change what it is to us and how we think about it? Well, it's interesting, oh, returning, it's interesting oh. returning to movies and, oh, sorry. 
No, 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 go, go on. I was just thinking like when you return to a song that you were into and then you re-listen to it and what it does to you and it might change. And also having a child and try and turning them on to cultural things that you loved at different points in your life. And then sometimes you're like, oh, that wasn't so good. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or I thought that she would get that, or I don't know. Uh, returning to things is very interesting, but try, but I want to, I don't know if this, I'm go, I know we're running out of time, but one of the things that I enjoyed about your movie in its Netflix, can, you know, delivery system way was, especially if you put earphones on and you watch something, I watched it once on a screen and then I watched it kind of like under the blankets with the thing, like a book. And it, it's very, um, I liked doing it. It felt like reading, like it felt like I was, secret and I and be, also because there's so many kind of the second time particularly like looking finding the clues that I didn't know were clues or yeah. not clues but you know things that would repeat yeah. Yeah. which at first I didn't know they would repeat because I was only seeing them for the first time and then catching them and anyway it would be in not to keep bringing up Virginia Woolf but I had to do that with her like I would be reading and you would segue into a different perspective and you know, and you wouldn't realize you were in a different character's yeah. head. And yeah. then you'd have to kind of go back and check and go, oh, okay, that's where we are. Yeah, um, anyway. I, love, I love that. I love the idea of that. I think, I think a lot about that, about trying to do that in a film. Um, so yeah, that interests me. I'm gonna read the book. Yeah. Well, to me, the, the reference is right in front of us in your movie, um, Oklahoma. Talk about something that ages, we see it in our youth. You know, and that's perfect at the high school level. Oh, what a beautiful morning. You get the feeling that, you know, this optimistic view of the world, maybe you see it later and find it more adult, more, there's darker shades to it. And then toward the end of the, your life, you realize you haven't lived a Rogers and Hammerstein life. You've lived a Samuel Beckett life. You're in crap's last tape or something. <laughs> that's the end of life. <laughs> You're in Godot. So yeah. Charlie, the trajectory is in your movie very clearly, you know. There was this really great revival of Oklahoma. Did you see it, Charlie? I didn't know. Oh, I it's heard so it was brilliant. Yeah. And it's yeah. very, it's very dark. It's yeah. very, it's, that, it's like it's Beckett of, laid on top of it's Oklahoma. Inter it's interesting that that song that's in, in my movie was cut, was, was not in the movie of Oklahoma. Right, that's the one that was cut. I removed that song. I don't know why, but I suspect I know why. Because it's because it's a really sad and somewhat scary song, you know the implications of that song. And I sit by myself like a cobweb on a shelf by myself in a lonely Uh, well, I'm, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today, but I wanted to thank you guys all so much for coming together, for, for having this great conversation. And I would encourage all of you, as soon as we're done, to go on the New York Times uh, and leave comments <laughs> no, on the top no, 10 list of the year. <laughs> you know, this, this was really a treat for me. So I, I thank you all so much for, for it. And um, it's 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 just it's wonderful. I don't get to meet a lot of people in the business, and certainly not now. So to to have all of you whose work I respect so much talk to me um, about this film is I don't know. This is very special. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>